Uh, all right, welcome to the KCP community meeting, May 25th. Uh, this is the agenda we have so far. Um, I spent a little bit of time this week. Uh, so I think I, uh, David sent out a great PR at the end of last week to get the demo actually working, which is very exciting. Um, the demo, the, the initial uh, uh, KubeCon demo was stand up KCP, send a deployment to it, watch it get split into two clusters and run and schedule and do stuff. Um, I think the next uh, sort of for our next trick, we're going to try to get, I think we could go one of two ways and probably both ways, which is uh, uh, allow the deployment author to give some information about how that should be split. Right now it's literally just cut it in half uh, A and B. Uh, and if the deployment wants to prefer one zone or over another or prefer one cloud over another or whatever, that should be possible to express by an author. Um, and then the other half, the other part of the next stage of the demo is going to be uh, watching it move after it's split. So uh, <laughs> something like adding a third cluster and seeing it spill, o spill over into a third cluster or deleting one of the clusters and seeing it sort of uh, coagulate back into the original cluster. Um, that turns into, like, to generalize how to do that, you'd have to express constraints. You'd have to express uh, uh, traits of the cluster to be able to satisfy those uh, user-specified constraints or tolerations, taints and tolerations in Affinity and blah, blah, blah. Um, I spent a little bit of time. Um, uh, sketching that out. So it's heavily based on your standard pod affinity, uh, anti-affinity node selector um, stuff with the quirk that we don't actually control the deployment type. So we're going to have to stuff everything into probably labels or annotations. Um, this is a, a, rough, uh, a rough look at this where you could say, you know, cluster US East 1 is in GCP cloud and is um, in US East one region. Uh, and then the deployment that says only run me on GCP clouds would do this kind of gross thing. It's not final and I don't love it, but uh, as, a, as a jumping off point, I think we can uh, start discussion from there. Okay, and actually, so this is a great one, Jason. So like, I think the mindset, and I, I think this is like the thing we should talk about. I guess I was kind of expecting us to do the, to move more to the words the transparent. So the splitter, I think we have, what you're thinking of phase two is go one step further on the splitter and then go to a phase three where we go back and look at a transparent. I yeah. kind of thought you were going to go to go transparent on deployment and then manage the splitters down. Both of those are fine. Are the use cases subtly different in a way that the splitter wouldn't be a logical step was maybe the question that we would have to ask. So like, uh, if you add the additional constraint that the object isn't copied at the KCP level, or it's not always clear, like deployment is the only thing you can really split like this. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, back. deployment is the obvious one you can split like this. We know there'll be others. Do you want to go to the archetype of splitting one more step because you think it's the most productive, or do you want to jump to the next one? Because I think both are fine. I just you have to, we yeah. want to be convinced that we're doing something that then leads back to transparent. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. If I can rephrase to make sure I understood what you said. Uh, right. This is very. This entire document is very deployment centric and not, you know, daemon set aware or anything else aware. Um, and we don't have to solve. We don't have to talk about constraints at all to get the next like. Another compelling demo is to do the like add a, add a cluster, see it spill over, delete a cluster, see it, you know, re rejoin. That doesn't require constraints at all. Um, and so, yeah, there's like three directions. One is do this for things that aren't deployments. One is do deployments, but with more knobs and control. And one is do deployments continuously, uh, you know, reconciling toward some some ideal state based on some definition of ideal. And I think that's useful. So it's like um, the then there's two characteristics, which is you need to summarize status. So 
you're still going to have to merge status back into the final deployment no matter what, which is OK. Um, so that's, that's, that's already done. Right, it's the same uh, across all three of the approaches. No matter what, the transparent multi-cluster use case assumes you're doing, you start with an object that looks like a cube object, you do quote unquote magic, things happen on underlying clusters, it's summarized up, you don't know the difference. So for deployment, just all three of those approaches fit it. You're doing cool. constraints, and then I think there's a separate one which is assignment. So there's like the policy side, and then there's the actual atomic thing that has to work for transparent. So that, no matter what we do, like Jason, you nailed it. We're not gonna be able to change the scheme of the objects, nor do we want to, to make transparent work. Uh, one of the thoughts, and like you kind of brought this up and I was kind of thinking on this is, the demo for transparent that we'll have to keep building on is you don't, it's transparent. So there's a, there's a kind of an interesting thing here, which is like all policy-based stuff, is uh, kind of orthogonal to transport to tr uh, to transparent because transparent either just magically works or you have a different kind of policy which makes it spread but you mm -hmm. will need to have enough of a, a substructure for preference and how preference is carried over from things to in the long run so again i'd probably say maybe we just define it as two axes Full transparent and policy. We can do the policy and say, like, here's some examples, but we do need to think about how the scheduler represents that you chose one zero one to zero one end clusters, such that the next time it recalculates, when it recalculates the move, it does that transparently. Uh yeah. Uh I guess I had I had imagined the next. The next level was a bit specific to to deployments, so that we can get experience with it and understand how to do it, and then generalize it. We can definitely generalize. Like, if you want to have a a foo CRD splitter that does something based on whatever a foo is, you should also be able to give it these labels and have the foo splitter understand how to split it uh, and and how to constrainedly split it. Well, but, and maybe a way of saying that differently is so transparent multi-class transparently multi-cluster implicitly assumes strategies mm -hmm. for how it's copied. And that involves sync strategies as well as split strategies. Maybe there's other strategies we haven't thought about yet. So continue yeah. to explore the split strategy of transparent multi-cluster is useful because it's somewhat more complex and it actually shows a net benefit, which is we know transparent multi-cluster for moving is interesting. But transparent multi-cluster for transparent HA would be almost more interesting. Uh, <laughs> because transparent HA for clusters, like moving is a prerequisite for other things. We should maybe we can do splitting and then come back to moving. And I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so like just some nitpicking, I'd probably say we should use JSON and annotations because uh, annotations can be longer and JSON doesn't, it compresses a lot better. And you can convert all JSON to YAML, but not vice versa. So I'd probably say, like, just from those two, like, if we do annotations for the policies, can you create a namespace for it? And the other one was, like, you chose labels that were different. I don't, like, why don't you try just using the cube labels for these and see how that plays out? So I had, I, there, a, a previous version of this did just use, like, did just use cube labels. Um, and then I thought when it gets down to the cluster, the deployment, like the regular deployment controller, the inside the cluster deployment controller has to figure out what to do with that to schedule it to nodes. I mean, maybe that's a strip policy coming down before split. Or maybe that's a policy that the sinker, because they're like, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Splitting is a strategy, uh, syncing status is a tool, maybe stripping fields is a tool. So like, um, and like, so recognizing that something has a pod template, we don't know what the pod, how the pod template is materialized when we look at a generic workload object, like a job, a stateful set, a daemon set. Um, those probably will all end up with strategies that are tied to the workload type. If someone gave us like an etcd uh, CRD and said generically split this, I don't know that we could without picking one of an archetype. So like we could say that the splitter strategy has sub strategies which are archetypes of like particular workload types. So you could say like um, uh, uh, 
because replica set deployment probably both fall within this uh, characteristic, yeah. and then maybe you could override the characteristic. That might be like another dimension of policy that comes in later, or we figure out we take one of the existing ones. But your point about like again, like the thought about transparent, I was like, so this is like why I was looking. I was like, hmm. So now I have to know these specific labels that are different than what the cluster is going to have. What if I already had those labels set, and then we ignored them in transparent? So that's not a yes or no, but like thinking about it, like does, if I've made, if I have a spread policy on a pod today that says spread by zone, should I be able to deploy that to a multi-zone GCP cluster and three single zone GCP clusters and the right thing happens at the transparent level? Interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's an example where you wouldn't want to strip that, that label as it goes through because something downstream could beneficial, like could use it to, to do something, right? Yeah, and then like the flip side of that then is like, well, we could always add additional affinity rules to a deployment spec template and say, mm -hmm. strip those off as they go through, <laughs> which would be the cluster scheduling. And, and actually, so then like the, the third bit would be, we're using cluster for right now. I do want us to put an asterisk anytime we say cluster, which is, I think, we want to have something more generic than cluster because cluster comes with so much baggage. Right. And I think we should explicitly label, I think it would help us to say, let's come up with a word that's not cluster, that's like location or uh, blah, 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 uh, spot that could be uh, <laughs> interfacing. Yeah. And then that way, and then that also helps break some assumptions because like then it's not a cluster selector. And then you're like, well, if I don't have, a, if I'm not, if I don't know what I'm targeting, maybe what I'm targeting actually isn't explicitly said. Like, I don't say I'm targeting a location. I define properties that the location has. And those are like just two different models. One of them simpler, mm. one of them might be more flexible. How do we figure out which, one, how do we learn which one, what the trade-offs are through the design work? Yeah, I mean, so, it, so the whole the whole system should be like, the the scheduler doesn't know what the string location means it's just a it's just a key that has a value and it knows that two replicas shouldn't have the same thing with the same value right like it doesn't uh location doesn't mean anything to the code location is a word that means something to the user so it's already generalizable but most of the examples we have in real life are i want this in two locations for you know for ha or i want this in uh, two zones for HA or whatever. Like the term zone doesn't also mean anything. Yeah, and um, maybe and maybe what we should maybe this okay. So this is actually like we're like turning over a lot of like this is like the meeting that you and I probably could have had, but like let's do it here because it's actually even better for more audience. Um, so there's placement criteria for accomplishing resiliency objectives mm -hmm. or placement policy for. Uh, for accomplishing um, criteria objectives. So uh, like, I want this to be placed here for that, uh, for like cost or because my minister said, but then there's a flip side of that, which is it isn't placement policy, it's a security or administrative policy that I could imagine. So for instance, two people have the same location one of them under the covers, I'm actually putting on a much more restricted set of nodes without them knowing it. Like, so thinking about how we could deliver an advantage, both from the resiliency, but also like, you know, cause like in, in my head is the, I want to run a million application spaces. And so it's got to be general purpose enough to solve for all those. So all those logical clusters, mm -hmm. some of them are apps, some of them are uh, random Joe Blow creating a, a demo app of a, of a Knative function. Joe Blow does not match the security profile of trusted microservice team A. So thinking about like location as like anything we can do to kind of put that into our mind path is good. So like, and that's kind of like where affinity comes in, but it's also where like the strip affinity might come out, which would be like uh, this workload, I can just tack a label onto it that gets stripped off automatically, doesn't go down to the, or it's ignored mm -hmm. by most participants. 
but then I could quickly and easily write an integration that says, no, 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 no. I want all workloads that de declare this capability to go here or the workloads who don't have this permission to also get pre-constrained. We don't like, that'll be an input to scheduling or placement or policy. We just haven't figured out what it is. Like it might be admission to policy. It might be admission to creation. Like we could decorate these objects on admission if we had to, or it could come from the logic yeah. cluster. And actually that's, so that's a, that, that is the, that's maybe like, let's say this a different way. The policy for scheduling is influenced by the locations that are available, whatever we call the object, but it could also be influenced by the policies applied to that logical cluster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it so it's it's, it's, it's not a, just an, a, a, an information that directly says where it should go. It's mainly just a set of rules uh, that are orthogonal uh, one to the others and finally uh, drive the the where where uh, an object will be uh, scheduled. Can't be too generic. If it's too generic, nobody figures out how to use it. Can't be mm. too specific because then it's hyper specialized and we have to <laughs> yeah. uh, like node selectors were too specific. Very useful. Mm. Raw primitive tolerations were an approach that improved on it. Tolerations have problems because someone can tolerate all taints, which completely defeats the value of toleration system instantly so there's already and then we we also rely on other policies that are kind of more implicit matching so we have to take the like i, I think and like this kind of gets back like i think it's the right thing to do jason to be influenced by these and then the next step would be um how much indirection should we have i bias a little bit more towards a stronger indirection from clusters and a stronger indirection from um assuming that it'll be just one input i kind of think we might actually need to be taking multiple inputs and like that would be a scheduler predicate or whatever like let's assume that we're reusing a logical structure that's a little bit like the the cube scheduler with predicates and priorities a predicate might be these labels could we do it generically enough that we could like that that we could solve the different use cases with the same couple of concepts that's probably what we're just trying and we should try them like this is fine to try that's kind of the, the thought going through my head yeah i think i actually started going the exact opposite direction uh which i think is still potentially productive hopefully potentially productive uh which is to say that like if a cluster knows it is a real cluster with real nodes uh it could uh it could sync up its nodes to the KCP and you run a real like node pod scheduler against KCP and it says, oh, like I need a node with, uh, I need a node running ARM and Windows or something. Uh, that means it ends up in this cluster. That sort of violates a lot of the uh, abstraction we like, uh, but it means that we don't have to write any new code potentially because we just run the regular, like I am a pod and I'm, I'm in, I am a pod in search of a node. I am a node in search of a pod match up. And then it goes through n layers of clusters to actually end up where it ends up. Um, but I get that that is a huge violation of the you know visibility concerns we we want to block. Well, so so actually let's frame it like this. So like we want to have a series of logical steps that make KCP the idea desirable. Um, that's we have a set of components um, like minimal API server um, and then sinker and then I think like uh, what we want is someone to be able to easily do these super obvious integrations and I think it's actually desirable to call them obvious which is obviously if you were somebody today you could go build this how would you go build this today you go run a hub cluster and then you would like and this is what virtual cluster has done they literally are ha hacking around the limitations of cube and so then if we have the mindset which is like okay how do we relax that restriction then they can fit into the kcp idea hierarchy tree and see benefit so like v cluster could use kcp right uh or use the minimal api server with a set of our opinionated things and we could say okay now v cluster or virtual cluster sorry virtual cluster then only has to add one abstraction 
which is the cut through of the scheduler level. So it's kind of like making ourselves useful and thinking in the way that they're already solving the problem and then say, hey, we can help solve this problem. Here's an example of it. And then, but what we think is that everybody should move in. Like now it's like the, we're building, everybody's building, like they take the current idea and they add one change. All we're trying to do is take three ideas, put them together and then pull together everybody's one ideas into some hierarchy of those things. So yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable approach. Um, we should just treat it as if it's a stepping stone, not a destination and, and call it out like that. Like, hey, here's the simplest possible cluster scheduling where you could just reuse that. Here's a write-up of how you could do it. Right. That's left to the reader. I think this is maybe another case also where we need a different word for KCP, the minimal API server on which you can build anything you want. And the constellation of things that includes KCP that does transparent multi-cluster and does logical clusters and does like uh, this is between transparent multi-cluster and um, and minimal API server. So maybe we would say it is um, uh, mechanical is the wrong word. Um, and obvious feels a little pejorative. Um, this is uh, practical. Multi-cluster yeah. scheduling, or yeah. Yeah, because finally the the current scheduler, even part of the current uh, cluster controller, uh, would be sort of examples. In fact, I mean use cases, yeah. examples of use of the minimal API server, and maybe um, pairing this. I mean some sort of reorg of of the um, repo sources first uh, to reflect that. Uh, pairing the, the, such re reorg with, um, you know, the the fa fact to provide KCP as a, as an API, just you know, even the simplest simplest bits of of this, you know, uh, extracting part of the KCP main file to uh, allow people run <clears throat> run their own code uh, on you know, just after uh, after on post start or something like that. I don't know, but at least. Uh, maybe a first step could be just wear the code to separate the core um, KCP value, minimal API server, uh, in, uh, resource type uh, imports, uh, a shared negotiation, and and separate that inside the code from other packages, which would be more, you know, in a different area. Uh, um, so I would say let's do, this, let's do the separation that keeps us from forgetting, but that doesn't slow us down getting to a transparent multi-cluster demo. I think yeah. this project's goal is to uh, like what do we like uh, build the ladder into the air as quickly as possible and leave little signs on the ladder like this goes off this way. And then once we get to the top of the ladder, we yeah. bring the ladder yeah. back down and we build it up from the bottom. Hmm. That would yeah. be my bias because I, I do think if we can't prove transparent multi-cluster can be made to work. And Jason, David, me, and then you know others who pay attention and like you know Devin cares about a kind of a very specific use case, and the virtual cluster guys will care about a very specific use case. Jason and the minimal API server will care about a minimal things. We want everybody to kind of see their thing, but we still have to. If we can't do transparent multi-cluster, a lot of the house of cards comes tumbling down. I feel like we need a yeah. mental pattern that we can be like, yep, we think this is achievable. And then we scale it. So like the scaling might be, let's get three people working on minimal API server and the cut for the library. Let's get three people working on um, mm. what the uh, what the sinker, the the starting from the scaffolding, what the generic sinker, and then we can say, okay, hey, virtual cluster. So we're pretty convinced that our crazy use case would be there. We're ready to double down on making sure that we could fold the two code bases together. And we'll take this of yours and yours of this. And then like, instead of it being like five projects doing multi-cluster, we have one big happy family of people collaborating in the QB ecosystem around um, all these concepts. Is that, I mean, do you buy the argument that I'm kind of making here, which is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, think, I think I went down a wrong path, uh, not that it's a bad path, but a wrong path about, uh, what transparent multi-cluster, how much transparency you were looking for, right? Like, like to be able to express constraints <laughs> requires some visibility into what multi-cluster is happening. But, uh, and, and yeah, so it's like, but at the same time, like this is the, so 
if we can't do 95% transparency, we have to go back and, 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 and come at a different approach. But yeah. if we can do 95% transparency, then we then have to be able to do preference yeah. of yeah. five different dimensions. I think the preference stuff helps. And what we would be is like, okay, so now we got a like preference step in, that'll color how we think about the rest of it. We were gonna have to do that anyway. If we get to transparent multi-cluster and can't come up with a way to express preference. So it's at least useful to put the, like we're kind of putting a, a shell around us as we climb the ladder. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, right, this work is not uh, wasted. It's just not yet. Uh, first, so for the for the next demo, we're not going to care about, I think you're saying we should not care about preference. We should not care about expressing scheduling constraints. We should focus on being able to do the demo of add a third cluster, it spills over, delete it, it goes back to the two. Yep, and then do delete, and I think like delete the one and it moves. So spill yeah. or move, We and we could do spill and then do move next, or we can do spill and move at the same time. I, move requires a bunch of other coordination, so there's a bit of like, we can do it without the app level stuff and be like the same thing, Like we, maybe if the spill code roughly fits it, and then we go back and we generalize to another workload and then another and another and another. That could right. be like the then subsequent steps after the spill case. So I think uh, the the code for being able to spill into a third cluster is, if it is generalizable enough, is the same code for saying, oh no, uh, I am only in, uh, like, I am supposed to be scheduled across as many clusters as we have and there are only two. It's. Uh, <laughs> It's Think just a control loop, right? It's just saying like fit me into what is available at all times. Well designed, a well-designed control loop, I think, is the fundamental. Yeah. Um, it's easy to do the one way and then not think about the sync loop, but like right. get the inputs to the sync loop, right? And so that that may be my argument for changing from cluster to location, which would be the yeah. location coordinates could just be a cluster name. And it's okay for it to stay cluster now, but if then if you say like clusters, uh, we want to at least once we get to the transparent part, then the next step would be we'd have to have the indirection to location. So we can do it after. I'm yeah. fine with that. Yeah. Um, and then I think, and like, you have expressed move to be a separate thing. And I think moving can't be accomplished without some visibility into what you, you have to be able to push the liquid into a different bucket. And to be able to do that, you have to know there are buckets. Safely and transactionally too. And I think yeah. that's yeah. the... That's part of the transparent multi cluster, which is if we can't move a singleton stateful set, because uh, like we know PVs are going to be harder to move, but like yeah. we, we have a rough idea of how you could, like you use the snapshot API, you'll create a new PVC on the new cluster, and you'll say snapshot source, like the coordinates of the underlying, and we'll hack that together, make it work. We know how multi cluster um, ingress could work. Joaquin did a demo that's like super easy to reason about, which is like, you know, each of the clusters can say, oh, this has the same route, therefore I just give it to traffic or I redirect it to one of the others. Um, service to service, we don't have to worry about yet. And then um, we can kind of gloss over identity and all those. But once we have that bones in, we definitely need it to go from like one, two, three, down to one, one to zero, one to one, one to two to one. Mm -hmm. All of those are, um, all of those are just modes of it. And then the different strategies, if we have the sinker, the split strategy, yeah, the yeah. status sinker and the like with the strip or not strip, like I, I don't I wanna call this like a workflow engine for multi transparent multi-cluster, but at least in my head, like I think we're probably gonna end up like just looking at the list of resources, like there'll be a set of strategies. I guarantee we'll have like three strategies that are super specific for a particular resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if we can get away with three specific strategies and like five broad strategies and then like a couple of in the middle or variants, that I think would then be an indicator that we think we can make transparent multi-cluster work for other resources. Right. That also then leads into the library aspect, which is, oh, you want your specialized thing? Maybe KCP as a project, when it gets to that phase, could be like, we will let anyone in the world give us a sync strategy that has minimal dependencies on existing code, as long as it works for the use case and we can generalize it. So then like, mm -hmm. then we would be very open to like, hey, you've got crazy, you got an etcd object. Oh, this is an open source project. Please land, like you need an etcd strategy and it doesn't generalize. It's a little bit like the, I was thinking it was like the Linux kernel tree, which is if you're willing to support a driver, you can merge a driver but you have to follow the kernel conventions 
And then when you get refactored, you have to have the test or, you know, we'd have to have the test. But if we could come up with enough of that and like strategies are like the scalable thing so that anybody's like, oh, I want to go do a object storage uh, strategy that's like, you know, it does very specific things. If you can get that code decoupled enough or you can say like, all I need is this strategy and then my controller will pick it up, maybe we'll merge it. And then we'll we'll say like add an ED test that verify or add a um, unit test. We'll refactor it as we go. We guarantee you that once that's merged, it stays working. So then KCP can be like a place where people in the ecosystem add sync strategies that generically work for general things in the cube ecosystem. That could be like a long term. That, that was like a yeah. Because the alternative is like everybody forks it. Right. And it's like everybody yeah. has one fix, but no one. And like this could be a way for us to be like, oh, look, if anybody's willing to go fix etcd object syncing and you can show that it works, awesome. We've got that sinker. And then if you don't like that sinker, you can create a v2 sinker and choose that different strategy. And it's just like if it's small enough amount of code, we could have hundreds or thousands of strategies. Sounds good to me. As the, the whole uh, interest of uh, having strategy resources or objects that are then associated to one or several maybe, types maybe of not. Processes. I don't know. That's a great question. I would hope that we can have strategies that are mostly non-parameterizable. But if you need it, and maybe this is like what we have to think about. It's like, OK, so mm -hmm. say transparent multi-cluster starts working, and someone wants to extend transparent multi-cluster for a net new thing. They reuse a strategy. They build their own extension. Yeah. So that's like delegation. What's the middle ground? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, because it makes me think, you know, in CRDs, for example, for the scale and, and uh, status of resources, you can define mainly the field uh, in the object that, that will be used to implement this typical behavior. We Possibly, we could have some sort of strategies that are you know always the same typical behavior but then uh, that take their you know information from a different field some some sort of templates for strategies that are already prepared that but people that and then people can declaratively you know parameterize that that could be some yeah. some intermediate yeah, like, and like um so so like hypothetically just looking at what jason already has done for splitter um KubeFed v1 and v2 both had policies that are going to like that both share basic roots with what Jason's done and then go in a couple different directions. Karmada has a couple. It seems to me like and I want to I want to play this out a little bit with us first, but I bet you there's an 80/20 rule at play here for splitting. Which is the vast majority of the people, the vast majority of the time would be better off with a couple of of basic match existing use cases, and that's kind of what those projects represent. If we could get the splitter, the stateful set down to like four patterns or three patterns, like the stateful could be like the stateful strategy could potentially just actually be a maybe it's like the field that you're going to split on, the field that you have to inject, whatever. Like that's mm. one way to do it, and we'd say like, hey, just tell us the pod affinity field on your workload, and we'll go do the rest of the splitting. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm. there's. There's definitely wrinkles there. Um, maybe those objects aren't like we might need features on stateful set to make the strategy work. I do think there's a reasonable argument to push back once the the momentum is there on transparent multi cluster to say go to stateful set. Stateful set needs a way to start at an index above zero, or maybe we just add a shard name to the stateful set and that works fine too. Um, yeah. Stateful sets, like you know, someone who's using a stateful set today might rely on the fact that the zero in entity is the leader. We would might have to put something that says only set a boolean on the first one and pick the first one. Like that could be part of a strategy. But again, like if the strategies are reasonably based on use cases, cover an eighty percent rule with twenty percent of the features, then the escape patch is either go build a sub resource, mm. do extension of our code, or write a controller. I haven't quite figured out how writing a controller would work, but we should talk about that as we're going, which is it might be that pre-scheduling, we do something at the KCP level that lets people provide input about scheduling constraints in a way that the scheduler doesn't. So like in cube admission, like with namespaces, we made a mistake with namespaces, which is we did teardown, but not initialization. 
and we've tried to get momentum to get namespace initialization back. The initializer's work in Cube was going to be generic. I kind of regret that now and said we should have just done that for namespaces and then broadened. It might have had the momentum at the time. But ideally, going forward, we think about the initialization for extensibility. Cube did not, and it's a mistake. Um, so that there's a there might be a pattern there, which is like the scheduler's like, I'm still waiting for input because I know that there's a couple of people waiting for input, whether it's an initializer pattern or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And so it waits until enough info's in, and then it makes a scheduling decision. And if it can move gracefully at some point, like maybe some strategies explicitly say they don't support movement. I could imagine a few like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be that the scheduler is like, I've got to make a good decision, a perfect decision, versus I can make it good enough and then just move it later. The moving it later would be ideal. So that would be great because then we would just build that, like we would take the core controller JSON and then we'd say, right. like, oh, how would we fit in a mental model where as the score increases, is that descheduler? Do we copy cube or do we? You know? <laughs> uh, okay, so thinking toward next, what the next demo will be, it's effectively going to be, instead of splitting once and calling it a day, we keep we keep splitting based on current information uh, as of right now. So when when a new cluster comes in, it'll split. Do we also want to then go? There's there's always a hundred directions. Do we also want to go the direction of being able to generalize the concept of splitting into these strategies and say like now I got a K native service and it I you know this is supposed to be transparent. How do I split a K native service? Well, and it's interesting too because the your strategy could be implemented on the sync side if we didn't need to service the status the same way. So maybe the question then is, how do you generalize the splitter pattern? Is What is the user expectation for transparent multi-cluster so that they know, how do they know which clusters this lands on? So there's a couple ways we could do it. The splitter, the separate object is advantageous up until you have lots of clusters, and then I think splitter gets a little painful. Mm. But the splitter has one advantage, which is you could go tweak those objects individually. That's not really transparent, though. And K Nate or Cube Fed struggled with this, which was like, at some point, like, what's the transparency you want? Is it an 80 20 rule or is it like a, a policy that you're willing to do upfront? I think we're kind of leaning towards 80 20, where it's like, you should, we should kind of support the like, it kind of just works with some really simple stuff. And then you go all in, but all in requires you to add an object that totally customizes the strategy. And the moment you're in those deep use cases, you're not in transparent multi-cluster anymore. That would be my bias, because that creates a nice gap in the middle, which is like most people are happy, transparent. You can still accomplish complex. What does that trade-off look like? Then the second option would be like status summarization. So like we could just create a couple of conditions and yeah. do it that way. Uh, another one is sub resource. Um, and then the question yeah. is like, one of the nice advantages of writing it to the object is I kind of at some point think that we want to have all of the client or the uh, table generators for cube control get to add a field which says which locations it's on. Because hmm. like waiting for waiting for placement placed for the transparent multi cluster user. Yeah. Place. yeah. Uh, uh, well, that would look that would look like adding a can table printers go from labels? We would we would add a label to the uh, oh, you'd add an annotation or annotation or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah, so the annotation as a state, you could absolutely say, oh, well, let's figure out how to make uh, the table printer be yeah. dynamic to something that's a characteristic of the logical cluster or the extension. New use yeah. case, um, and we can hack it in at first and then come back to it, and then. Um, what it, and then that also tees up the one that I said I was going to work on and haven't worked on yet, which is the the punch through sub resources or the punch through resources, which would be it may be that it's okay to have the one deployment up top, but then you can tell, call cube control get replica sets and you see all the replica sets stitched in from the child clusters in a synchronous call kind of fashion. I want to at least play around with that, but there could be a sub resource which just summarizes it. Um, cube fed one was it cube fed one or two? I think it was cube fed one because cube fed two didn't have aggregated API servers that I remember. Um, the sub resource one would be interesting because then that would also encourage us to do make get cube control get sub resource work. 
So then you could say like, you know, cube control get pods or cube control get deployments. It lists the locations. Cube control get deployments dash dash sub resource locations shows you the details about where it got placed in a way that's actually interesting. And maybe the sinker has a custom sub resource that pairs with it. Like, so it's a, it's a way of like forcing us to think about the end user experience is what matters for transparent multi-cluster. The flexibility yeah. and the orthogonality is the, uh, we have to do that, but we have to do it within the use case. Like what does a human want? They just want the stuff to just work. It's, and that's why transparent's nice. Cause we can basically say, if it would confuse an existing cube user, can't be done. Yeah, because the, the current demo that, you know, shows you three deployments on the KCP side is, is quite, I mean, can be quite uh, disturbing. I mean, why do you see the other deployments? As, as a typical user, I would expect those two subsidiary deployments that will be synced to physical clusters to be created in some sort of other namespace or some place that is not visible by default. Right. But we know that you'll probably want to see that. So we're yeah, no yeah but some, I mean, you some want to see it, but you want to see it someplace else. And the someplace exactly. else would be what's the yeah. what's the gap that what is the functional gap in the API server magic that transparent multi cluster would need? Yeah, that, that's not the same person that will want to see them. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the thing about transparent the, so cube fed these were all mixed, and I actually think that you're right about persona, but like. One of the challenges with KubeFed was you had a perspective for a, a Cube cluster and a perspective, mm -hmm. a Cube cluster app and a perspective for a KubeFed app, and they weren't the same and they behave differently. I think the trick is transparent multi cluster is the exact opposite. It is the same perspective. Cube, Cube user has to come here and it just works the way they expect up until the point where we peel the curtain away because it doesn't have to be perfect. And then they can go get the additional data, but they go from the, it just worked the way I expected. And there's just one little thing that I, oh, this is interesting. Oh, I dig in, now I care. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, the, uh, that they would say like, get my deployment and it would say 15 of 15 replicas there. Is definitely the, expected, yeah. yeah. But and only if they look at the conditions that says, you know, seven in cluster A and eight in cluster yeah. B, then then they know what's and maybe what's and maybe this is like in the generic, like so maybe the splitter strategy. And again, like QFed kind of tried this, but I I want to come back and like examine what they did and then try something different, which would be maybe the splitter strategy actually writes an annotation back to the object that has yeah. the that has the behavior of Maybe that then comes with location, which is maybe splitter strategy is itself something that could show up in a cube control get, because what we say is like, you know, I can look at an object, figure out what <laughs> locations it's on or what it's assigned to, zero, one, or n. But I could also get info status from the strategy, either as conditions, because conditions can't carry arbitrary fields. So maybe like the condition message has it, but then there's something like the annotation just for the sake of argument for right now, also carries information about the strategy, which could be generically shown. And then maybe there's a strategy sub resource, or maybe there can be multiple strategies. Like, I guess it really depends. Like, we need to, we need to work mm -hmm. through deployments enough that we can be like, one strategy with three parameters is enough, or uh, one strategy with no parameters, but a separate object. So then naturally, when I see that location, mm -hmm. we'll be like, hey, do you have a policy or not? That's maybe something that the sync that the the sync would but, but but there's something a bit like that for scaling. I mean, um, the scale sub resource uh, and creates a, a distinct object under the cover, if I'm not mistaken. Um, doesn't it create something like a horizontal uh, scaler or something like that? I don't remember the name, but when I looked into the code, I mean. There's a there's a there's an object of a type that's returned by the sub resource, which is the generic interface that is yeah, then okay. that's so it. Like, yeah, absolutely. And and that's what I think it is, but like we, we talked about this as like polymorphic sub resources a very long time mm. ago in Cube and just never explored it. But if it was possible to use KCP to explore it and then to say, like, no, no, this makes the transparent, like it again, makes the transparent multi-cluster use case super like easy to understand but still mm -hmm. discoverable that's yeah. the difference from cube fed v1 logical clusters the other difference if you get it all working now that cube is super successful and you can add extensions 
can the strategy apply to other resources? If you can do all three of those things, you have demonstrated something that no one else can do quite yet, which is mm. like, just make multi-cluster detail. <laughs> Asterisk, this is hard. <laughs> yeah, sounds easy, should be. And Twitter is a, is a concrete strategy, I think is also a great way to start, because we don't actually have to go to a generic strategy approach mm. until we have a splitter that represents the split strategy. And we can say like, oh, like what other resources might fit into the splitter strategy? Yeah. Config that. Right. I think, we, I think we know that the split strategy is the most common and compelling strategy, but we will want other strategies. It, it, it also only works on things that are completely stateless and have no dependencies on anything else, which is great because that's actually most apps. And yeah. Yeah. it would work for Knative functions and it would work for other things going forward. Um, I don't know if we have still other aspects to discuss on this point, um, but if it's not the case, um, I, I would possibly just mention the, the second point that, that you just stopped me if you still have to discuss. Yeah, go, no, go ahead. Um, yes, the second point you mentioned, because it, it's amusing, it, it makes me think of it. Uh, I think there are some common aspects. Um, Especially, you know, for now, um, we just import always uh, the API resource of the last cluster. We don't do any negotiation, any diff. So, of course, we'll have to be able to, if you have a resource already existing that had been imported by a CRD into a logical cluster, and then uh, you plug a new physical cluster that will try to import uh, the same resource as well, then we have to make the, dis the diff know if it's compatible or not, calculate the LCD, etc. And, and so, yeah. And, and I like to tie into the previous one, to be transparent, the requirement is, I don't have to think about API differences until I do. So like that would be the constraint is like, we're trying to show that API differences can be mitigated with yeah. 93. Exactly. And that, um, implementation wise, um that you know what we were discussing i see a sort of parallel between the the two cases because um for the deployments for example of course it's the it's at the level of of the objects of the instances but then for one deployment one uh abstract deployment let's say it like that you have two um uh subsidiary deployments on the kcp side that will be synced and then uh, we would have, you know, at some point, and uh, to uh, if they exist as real deployments or as sub resources or as status of of a strategy instance or anything else, at some point we have to uh, to describe them and and to track them as well, and that's a bit the same for CDs because now um, we import you know, the result of, of the import of, of an API resource as a CRD in the logical cluster. But then when we start thinking about how do we track that in time, uh, if there is one, if, if there is an API resource of a given physical cluster that changes, one imported CRD uh, from another logical cluster that changes, for example, then we have to um, reconcile that to check that everything is still consistent. So we have something to track and finally, we would have, it seems to me, that one way or another, we will have to keep track in the KCP logical cluster that imports those resources of the various schemas that led to uh, the current, I mean, to the currently used schema in, in a given uh, logical cluster. Because I that actually, So I think there's some nuances here, and I think I understand some of those, but I might say, the goal of CRD normalization is to so that a sinker or another controller does not have to care. I yeah. think yeah. the minimum requirement is from the point you, okay, so in a given logical cluster that has access to a set of locations, the mm -hmm. only CRDs that should be allowed in that namespace are the consistent set, the union of those. So I think yeah. it's an even more complicated problem than this, which is, I don't think if, if I think if, um, so let's, let's say you have a hundred clusters. I think if we're gonna support a thousand logical clusters, there is a very good chance that we actually need to support um, 
999 of those having three clusters, all of which are different sets of those hundred. <laughs> That's a pretty complex graph theory problem, but it's tractable. What I would probably say is we're looking for the semantics on the CRDs such that callers don't have to worry about this stuff. And so I yeah. think one mental model would be somewhere you have to record the decision of the set of fields for a yeah, given, that's the point for given logical cluster, as you said, that could be a CRD in that logical cluster. Um, but if we have to reuse it across a lot of them, we might need some abstraction there. So it's, I think the CRD mechanism is going to be a lot of code, honestly, maybe there's a simpler approach, but from a use case perspective, you have to lock in a set of versions. You have to know what that schema is. And then an incompatible yeah. chain, like if you brought in a new location and that's incompatible with those, you have to make a decision one way or another, like either exactly. you do location yeah. or you, or you break all three of them. I think like we, we need to have use cases around that. So like the use cases need to be based on transparent multi-cluster an end user adds a location with an incompatible. They expect their existing apps to keep working. That's not a valid location target. Yeah, I think I think um, we can we can get a demo of this. That is so the the next demo is at a third cluster. See it take up space in that cluster. Remove that cluster. It goes back. Uh, we can also do at a third cluster. Okay, now upgrade to a version of Kubernetes where init containers don't exist. But my deployment requires init containers, and so uh, it had been scheduled there. It gets evacuated from there and sucked into the two yeah. other clusters that do work. That's like. An achievable demo that also is a <laughs> midpoint between what we want to do next and scheduling, yeah. which yes. is a big thing. Like how CRD type uh, compatibility is actually a scheduling constraint. Is the, trans it? the transparent multi cluster scheduler, which it could be distinct from other types of schedulers, implicitly yeah. depends on syncing, like a fairly generic mindset to resource syncing, and a logical model of. Are the things that I've already synced compatible with the new thing? But the yeah. idea would be to make the syncer not have to worry about that, and the scheduler that only loosely care about that, but the 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 CRD normalization yeah, exactly. to do yeah, the, yeah. the hard the heavy lifting. So conditions yeah. and hmm. schema like if we need to add a schema version, which is a, yeah. a monotonic incrementing generation to CRDs, let's do that. Yeah, so so it actually fits that mostly, but. So it, I mean, just to summarize and to be sure I understood your your answer, um, it doesn't seem full to you that um, in the logical cluster we would use some you know CRD or some object uh, in any, anyway. Uh, at least we have to store uh, the various schemas of the uh, resources that were imported uh, into this logical cluster. Um, separately from the um, resulting CRD that is um, that would be the LCD of the of all the compatible schemas. I mean, we have to track this history of, of the schemas that were the source of the result if we want to be able to change and to check validity afterwards. Yeah, and, and there's a further constraint, which would be um, it's like the storage of that, I would go ahead and think of that as a different resource type than CRD. Yeah. Because it's part of a controller logical subsystem mm -hmm. that maybe, and like, yeah, so goal one is represent that history, merge it into CRDs mm -hmm. across logical clusters. Goal two might be make it really efficient, or goal two might be figure out how it fits into a hierarchy, like does, I kind of think CRDs are uh, driven by location for transparent multi-cluster. There are other use cases for CRD normalization that we'd want to think about. So we should not over pivot too much, but the goal of like entrance, so let's just say it, the transparent multi-cluster use case is an administrator's defined a location or ICANN. Yeah. That implies CRDs a logical cluster is able to create instances of the CRDs that match the cluster transparently. Mm -hmm. And when those change in an incompatible way, I degrade gracefully 
that subsystem might be usable or should be usable in a number of different ways, like, but it's driven by location, not driven by end user as much. Yeah, 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 sure. Because mm -hmm. again, and like, this is like the wrinkle too, is like, if location is not cluster, that leads to other advantages. Like you might, you might have multiple locations on the same cluster. I think operationally, like that's almost going to be a requirement. We don't have to solve for it now, but like, yeah. The idea that a location comes with a set of CRDs and a set of CRDs translates into a unified set of CRDs. Yeah, yeah. And that CRDs are materialized in a logical cluster. And then those are materialized in the most efficient way possible. That is, that can be implemented any way you so choose, which like it, it's yeah. a fundamental part of KCP, the project, if it exists for transparent multi-cluster and logical clusters. So yeah. finally a location becomes a sort of logical domain. Yeah. And, and maybe like the uh, the CR like you can imagine a future state where the sinker is creating these CRDs or creating the other types of CRD resources for versions, and then the whole CRD serving mechanism in KCP in the minimal API server is completely stripped and replaced by a more advanced version of it mm. to solve the logical multi-cluster case in a way that's flexible. That probably could be how it plays out, which is like cube stays the same. We make the cut points in the Cube API server palatable for replacing the whole CRD implementation <laughs> with a separate one, which it is today. Like it's not actually that coupled, but we would make those cut lines stronger, and then there would be an explicit multi-cluster CRD normalization exposure mechanism that reads these other CRD types, surfaces them into logical clusters based on what locations are there. And then someone else could take that and remix that and do whatever they want. Maybe it's only us, or maybe it goes into core cube and every cube cluster has this. We just don't yet. Okay, so for Green now. Big. <laughs> no, bigger. <laughs> bigger. So for now, I'll continue. Uh, I started implementing a, a schema difference already. Um, just, you know, uh, you have two uh, schemas from, from CRD, Chis uh, and Schema Props. And, and then you get the diff. And based on that, we, we could, you know, go the next steps and define rules to know when schemas are compatible or not and how to, and, and, and you know, the rules also to, to, to deduce if it's valid or not to create a, a LCD. Mm -hmm. And based on that, we would be able to, you know, go, go then the path you, you mentioned and storing the, the various schemas and then including all that into a higher reconciliation loop so that when some api changes that were that was imported we would check again the validity of all the the sources from the currently used resulting crd does it make sense to you uh, yeah. as a you know pass to go for a while and then we just have to keep we'll have to we'll have to basically keep going up the efficiency chain because like yeah <laughs> we know that we know that we'll have to go through a series of phases to get there and that's fine I have to drop. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We got next steps. See everyone. Bye.